standing and join me in our opening prayer. Almighty God, you have sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross. Grant that we may share in his obedience to your will and in your glorious victory and his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns to be you of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please turn to your neighbor and offer the peace of Christ to this world. <laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy winter. <laughs> it's a little chilly out there today. I think the wind chill was in the teens. The teens. The teens this morning. It was some kind of cold. Well, it's good to see everybody here. Um, you know, it's pretty much a big week. Excellent. Busy. Pretty much a busy week at the church. What week is it? Holy, holy week. Holy week. Holy week. Why is it holy week? Because it was bubble. Go, say it. Yeah, Jesus coming on my pony. <laughs> Coming on a pony. Donkey, I mean. Coming on a pony. It's okay. It's <laughs> okay. Coming on a pony. Coming with the donkey. Coming with the donkey. And so, what services we had this week? We have our Good Friday service. How many have never been to our Good Friday service? A recreate. You have not been to our Good Friday service? Well, I'm putting in a call to your family this week. <laughs> it, is, it is probably one of the best services, impactful services, meaningful services here at Good Shepherd. Amen. So I do hope that not only do you come, but that you bring somebody else with you this Friday at 6.30. Um, Easter services... Sunday at 9.30. There's bunches and bunches still in your bulletin. This will be the last week that I have the volunteer insert in there. I think I'm up to three return. This is the last day for your Easter tulips order form, 324.24. Those need to be handed in the offering plate in the front or the back. Those are due today. This is the last week. Um, that we're collecting, that we've added. Remember, we've supplemented our non-perishable food collection. For the end of March, we're at cereal, so we're finishing up this week with cereal to next month. We go to condiments and spices and items like that. You know, we all know we want some ketchup and mustard or on our burgers <laughs> and hot dogs, right? So you can get, you know, you can pick up stuff from the food pantry and the food bank and stuff like that. But gosh, wouldn't some mustard and relish on that hot dog be good too? So they don't get those items. So spices and you know hot sauce, because everyone needs a little hot sauce in their life. Uh, a couple other things. Spring cleanup. I know it's a month away. It's April 20th. Spring cleanup at the church. You'll see I have different times posted everywhere. I think we decided on 8 o'clock. And then I think that the uh, introduction announcement says 9 o'clock. <laughs> and we have it here 9, and maybe 8.30. <laughs> so, you know, eight to it's 8 to 12. <laughs> but if you can't make it at 8, make it at 9. We know some of you like to sleep in on Saturday mornings. But there's work to be done at the church, that, and, you know, there's, there's no... Good day to do it, there's no bad day to do it, but we try and set a date. We have some benches that need to be stained, we have some lawn care that needs to be tended to, some a lot of mulch that will need to be spread. So bring your wheelbarrows and pitchforks and garden gloves and all of that stuff because there's going to be a lot of work done on that day. If you have your offering with you today, there's a collection plate in the front 
And in the back, if you're joining us online, www.goodshepherdumc.com. Thank you. That's awful, Saul. Huh? All right. Jesus taught his followers that money is not a financial matter, but rather a matter of the heart. He said, where your treasure is, this is where your heart is. A maturing faith in Christ is always accompanied by growing generosity. Let us pray. Lord God, as we fully seek to surrender ourselves to you, we ask that you receive our tithes and offerings as an expression of putting our treasure where our heart is. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're comfortable and able, please rise and join me in singing Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
What a gift, huh? What a gift for this church to be able to hear these beautiful voices and the beautiful playing of the piano. So thank you, Norm, Yetta, Miss Betty, thank you all so very much. And now it's our turn to be excited to be able to sing, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. If you're comfortable and able, please rise. It's number 277 in your hymnal. And I know this is an oldie but goodie, so I know you know this one, so let's sing it with some energy. <laughs> Jesus Christ was coming to town. 
Prophecy was about to become reality. The gospel tells us that Jesus sent disciples ahead to prepare for his arrival. Historians tell us that traditionally, persons from various regions had all had their special area in Jerusalem where they would stay, where they would camp during this feast season. The south end of the Mount of Olives had for years been the camping grounds for the people of Galilee. They were the unsophisticated, the unspoiled people. <clears throat> and that's where Jesus had spent most of his time, and that's where Jesus performed most of his miracles. They knew him the best. On several occasions, they had actually tried to go ahead and make him their king. John 6, 14 and 15 says, quote, After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself, end quote. In the city of Jerusalem, where the wealthy and the superficially religious leaders, Jesus had antagonized them. And he used to refer to them and the Pharisees as all hypocrites. Also among them were the Sadducees, who had long been plotting his downfall. In order to preserve their wealth and lifestyle, they had consorted with the conquering Romans. In doing so, they compromised their faith. They had so much to lose if they displeased their Roman overlords. These man-pleasing priests and scribes plotted their wicked death scheme. The poor Galileans had nothing to lose. The city dwellers would do anything to placate the Romans in order to continue to prosper. To them, the whole issue was about money. It was about the economy. In their eyes, Jesus was very expandable. Besides, in the eyes of the religious leaders, he was a threat to their religious tradition. He was not what they considered their Messiah. Now, in Mark 11, 9, there were two groups. The first group, those who went before. They were the persons who had come out of Jerusalem because they were really curious. They heard all this shouting and they wanted to know what's really going on, so I think I'll go and take a look. The second group were those who followed or cried out. They were the Galileans. Some would end up shouting Hosanna, praising him and others, as we know, ended up shouting crucify him. <clears throat> if you were to reflect on your lifestyle today, here is my question for you. Do you daily put Jesus to open shame by your words and your actions and your deeds? Or is your lifestyle one that is very pleasing to him? Resulting in not only you praising him continually, but those around you praising him. You see, if your crowds of friends are non-Christians, it is easy to get caught up in the worldly ways. If the crowd you hang out with are true Christians who show their love for the Lord on a daily basis with their words and actions, then you're more likely to do the same. Again and again, we say, be careful who you hang out with. That goes for adults as well as children. You know, timing is critical in most everything we do. Doing the right thing at the right time is important. Don't grow weary and become discouraged in waiting on God's timing. Because his clock is never, ever wrong. He knows the perfect time for absolutely everything. Therefore, we need not to worry about the question, when? We remember that Passover was a celebration commemorating the deliverance of the Jews from Egyptian captivity. It was always on the 15th of the Jewish month of Nisan. All who lived within 20 miles or so of Jerusalem were required to attend. I think it would be pretty cool if we could require
require people to attend church. Right, Pastor Nicole? Amen. Don't they have to be here? Actually, Jews from all over the world gladly gathered, gladly gathered for this major happening. As excitement amounts with approaching holidays, you know how excited we get for Easter's coming, Christmas time, all the holidays, 4th of July, the holidays that we get excited for, that we pray, pray for, prepare for. So an air of exhilaration had preceded Passover. But they went to extensive uh, preparations. They repaired roads, tombs were whitewashed, children were rehearsed in the significant event. They all had a part in it. And the prophet Daniel prophesied this would happen. He knew years and years and years before God told him when this would happen. Now remember, Jesus went to Bethany six days before Passover, and he entered into Jerusalem the next day. And that was the exact amount of days as what Daniel had prophesied. This may seem to be an impromptu happening, but believe me, it had been scheduled in eternity a long time in advance. Again, God's timing is always perfect. It's important to know that God the Father wanted God the Son to be well identified on his visit here on earth. Jesus fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament that all these, all these filling of uh, prophecies pointed very clearly to who he was. We were talking in Bible study Monday night of how incredible it is that Jesus knows your every name, every hair on every head. And yet, how easily we forget the name of someone we were just introduced to three minutes ago. But here's my story, my, here's my funny for today. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, anybody know who that is? Do you? Actually, great Sherlock Holmes. That's right, creator of the world fictitious detective Sherlock Holmes. He tells this story about himself and his identity. As he tells it, he was waiting for a taxi outside the railway pack station in Paris. An accommodating taxi driver drives up, <clears throat> puts his suitcase in, got in himself. And as he went about to tell the taxi driver where to go, the driver turns around and says, well, where can I take you, Mr. Doyle? Doyle was astounded. He asked the driver, "If did, did you know me by sight? The driver says, no, sir, I've never seen you before. And puzzled, Doyle asked the driver, um, how did you know who Conan Doyle was? And the driver responded this, this morning's paper had a story that you were on vacation in Marseille. This is the taxi stand where people who return from Marseille always wait. Your skin color tells me you were on vacation. The ink spot on your right index finger suggests to me that you were a writer. Your clothing is English, not French. Adding all these pieces of information up, I deduct that you indeed are Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And Doyle exclaimed, this is amazing. You are a real life counterpart to my fictional character, Sherlock Holmes. There is one other thing, the driver said. Oh, what's that, Doyle said. Your name's on your suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> Zechariah 9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, daughters of Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And also, it did, it had to be a colt that no one had ever ridden before. These were some pretty specific instructions. But Jesus knew where these resources that he needed were. He didn't ride in on the donkey because he thought, oh, this will be fun. No, he knew it was to fulfill the prophecy. So my fun fact on that is, at no up did you realize, at no other time in the gospel does Jesus ever ride a donkey? Just that time. I thought it might be just fun to research why a donkey? Why did Zechariah foretell a donkey? 
Well, I'll be honest, it was easy to research thanks to our Bible study book that we're doing this week on Luke, because I just happened to have that handy. You see, throughout history, riding a donkey was associated with royalty. In Genesis 49, 11, Jacob speaks to his son Judah, promising Judah and his descendants will bear the royal scepter and describes him tying his male donkey to the vine, with the cult of his female donkey to the vine branches. From this verse forward in the Bible, riding a donkey is associated with royal authority. In a famous incident, King David fled Jerusalem on a donkey. His son and heir Solomon later entered a city on a donkey. From the book that we were reading, I share with you Zachary Oh, Are we to write that? That's <laughs> cute. That's cute. Did yeah. <laughs> you notice what does a donkey have on its back? Cross. A cross. <laughs> Don't breathe. All right. Zechariah also foretells that God will come to his people from the Mount of Olives. Jesus intentionally fulfilled this prophetic words in Zechariah. He was making a clear and dramatic statement regarding his identity by mounting the donkey to descend the Mount of Olives. He was saying, I am the Messiah, the descendant of David, your king. But Zechariah notes the significance of the donkey pointing to the character of the king who was riding her. He is humble and riding on an ass, on a cult, the offspring of a donkey. The word Zechariah uses for humble is the Hebrew word ani, A-N-I, which also means lowly, afflicted, poor, or needy. Jesus comes into Jerusalem identifying with the poor, the lowly, the afflicted, and the needy. You know, Jesus not only had 12 apostles, but many, many disciples. And the owner of the donkey obviously was one, or why else would he give up his donkey? A disciple is a learner or a, a follower. Every Christian really is. Every one of us are disciples of Jesus Christ. Today, every, every true follower of the Lord and supporter of his cause is needed. We have work to do. Our Lord needs us to pray, to study, to give guidance, and financially support his causes. These things should be done willingly with a glad heart, eagerly, spontaneously. Though he had the authority to command it, he gave the opportunity to refuse it as well. He had the integrity to make his request through his disciples, and he had the honesty and the justice to return it. So I wonder, what resource do you possibly have that the Lord Jesus wants you to use for his glory? Are some of those resources that you have or something to do that can help this church on spring cleanup day or any other time of the year? Are you that resource we need to make sure that we are using our time and our talents the way Norm and Yetta and Betty did today, but that all of us are using our time and talents to serve Jesus. Through the ages, there have been those who have delighted to serve meaningful, though menial, roles in the kingdom. <laughs> he has always had those of us who delight in the, being the equivalent of his donkey. That is the means by which he achieves his purpose. You see, that's why we're all here. We are to be the means by which he achieves his purpose. I cannot possibly list all the people Jesus has called to achieve his purpose. Actually, in a perfect world, I would have a list to name every human being because that's who God calls every single one of us. You don't have to be famous like Billy Graham or Mother Teresa. You don't have to have started your own denomination like John Wesley or Martin Luther. 
Every single one of you is called to be an instrument that Jesus uses for his purpose. You see, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And this salvation comes through the pouring out of his blood for the many, for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus offers salvation, righteousness, and new life to those who humble themselves before him. Belonging to him means we have eternal peace with God. So now the parade has ended, and Jesus goes to the temple. He looked around at everything, but it was already pretty late. <clears throat> so he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now Bethany was about two miles east of Jerusalem. And this is where Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, lived. Since they were his close friends, scholars believe that perhaps this is where Jesus spent the night. Well, if you think you have a busy week coming up this week, I want to talk about what Jesus' week looks like. You see, one of the things I always do on Sunday is my husband and I sit on Sunday afternoon and say, all right, what's happening this week? Okay, like, you know, we have one grand dog coming Thursday, we have another grand dog coming Friday, we have two dogs for 10 days, craziness. So yes, a crazy week. But listen to Jesus this week. On Monday, which would be day two, Jesus returns with his disciples to Jerusalem. Along the way, he cursed the fig tree because it had failed to bear fruit. Scholars believe that the cursing of the fig tree represents God's judgment on the spiritually dead religious leaders of Israel. Others believe the symbol extended to all believers demonstrating that genuine faith is more than just an outward religion. True, living faith must bear spiritual fruit in a person's life. It is believed that he spent the night again in Bethany with his friends Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So now it is Tuesday, day three. Jesus and his disciples returned to Jerusalem. They passed that withering fig tree on their way, and Jesus spoke to his companions about its importance. Back in the temple, religious leaders were upset at Jesus for establishing himself as a spiritual authority. They organized an ambush with the intent to place him under arrest. But Jesus evaded their traps, and he pronounced harsh judgment on them. Later that afternoon, Jesus left the city, and he went with his disciples to the Mount of Olives which sits due east of the temple, and it overlooks Jerusalem. Here Jesus gave his Olivet Discourse, an elaborate prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of age. He speaks, as usual, in parables, using symbolic language about the end-time events, including his second coming and the final judgment. Scripture indicates that this Tuesday, was also the day Judas Iscariot, Iscariot negotiated with the Sanhedrin, the rabbinical court of ancient Israel, to betray Jesus. After a tiring day of confrontation and warnings about the future, once again, Jesus and his disciples returned to Bethany to spend the night. Take a moment with me, please, and realize that Jesus knows what's coming but he continually focuses on others. He's continually trying to teach, trying to get them to realize who he really is and why they need to believe in him. What would you be doing if you knew you only had one week to live? Would you continue to try and get your family and your friends to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Or would you perhaps want to do something much more selfish. Day four, Wednesday. The Bible doesn't say what the Lord did on Wednesday of Passion Week. Scholars speculate that after exhausting two days in Jerusalem, that Jesus and his disciples spent this day resting in Bethany in anticipation of the Passover. Just a short time previously, remember, Jesus had revealed to his disciples and to the world that he had power over death by raising Lazarus from the grave. And after seeing this incredible miracle, 
Many people in Bethany believed that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, and they put his, their faith in him. Also in Bethany, just a few nights earlier, Lazarus' sister Mary had lovingly anointed the feet of Jesus with her expensive perfume. Holy Week takes a somber turn on Thursday. Jesus sent Peter and John ahead to the upper room in Jerusalem to make preparations for this Passover feast. That evening after sunset, now remember, Jesus knew what was coming. He knew the torture that laid ahead. And yet, Jesus washed the feet of his disciples as they prepared to share the Passover. By performing this humble act of service, Jesus demonstrated by example how we believers need to love one another. This Thursday evening at Ocean City Tabernacle and in many other churches in the area, they're pre presenting the Living Last Supper presentation. It is open to all, and I encourage you to attend somewhere so that you are reminded how important this week is, how important Thursday is. That's what gave us this gift of Holy Communion. Then Jesus shared the feast of Passover with his disciples, and he said this, quote, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now, I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. End quote. As the Lamb of God, Jesus was about to fulfill the true meaning of Passover by giving his body and his blood to be shed in sacrifice, freeing us, every single one of us, from sin and death. During this Last Supper, Jesus established the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, instructing his followers to continually remember his sacrifice by sharing in the elements of the bread and juice. Later, Jesus and the disciples left the upper room and went to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prayed in agony to God the Father. Luke's Gospel says that his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Late that evening in Gethsemane, Jesus was betrayed, betrayed with a kiss by Judas, and arrested by the Sanhedrin. He was taken to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, where the whole council had gathered to begin making their case against him. Meanwhile, in the early morning hours as Jesus' trial was getting underway, Peter denied his master, denied even knowing him, three times before the rooster crowed. Good Friday, this Friday, is the most difficult day of the week. Christ's journey turned treacherous and acutely painful in those final hours leading up to his death. And I promise you, from the bottom of my heart, that there is nothing you have planned for this Friday evening that is more important than coming to church and remember Jesus hanging on that cross for you. Today, Palm Sunday, holds significant importance for four special reasons. It fulfilled prophecy. It marked the end of the Jewish system. It revealed Jesus as the Messiah, and it symbolized his peaceful intentions. As Jesus approaches our lives, we must choose how are we going to respond? I pray that we humbly accept his lordship and welcome him as our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Take a moment, will you please, and pray with me that a prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who 
those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the Lord is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you're comfortable and able, please rise and join me in singing Hosanna, loud Hosanna, number 278 in your hymnal, where the words will be found on the screen.